So good afternoon. I want to start off today by addressing the protests that occurred last night across the Commonwealth. Our Commonwealth and our nation continue to experience pain and outrage in response to the murder of George Floyd at the hands of the police in Minneapolis. Thousands and thousands of people are making their voices heard and taking a stand against the violence and injustice that befalls the black community every day across this country. The circumstances are incredibly daunting. We are in the midst of a global pandemic, fighting a virus that is incredibly infectious through close contact. We've asked people to stay home and close their businesses to isolate and protect their health. And it's working. But we understand this guidance is in conflict with assembling to exercise First Amendment rights. We ask everyone to balance the fight against the virus with the fight for what we as individuals believe in. For the fourth night in a row, people have marched, prayed, and made their voices heard here in Massachusetts. I want to thank the vast majority of the folks who've done so peacefully and safely. I also want to thank the men and women in uniform, including law enforcement, EMS, fire, and the National Guard, for doing your jobs to protect your communities while ensuring others the right to speak out. We're grateful for your service. Last night, assemblies and marches took place in Boston and Brockton. They were largely peaceful. There were moments of tension and raw emotion. People shared their pain and frustration. They shared their agony and their anger over the injustice that pervades our nation. It was hard to watch at times. There were also powerful moments, including some dialogue between law enforcement and the demonstrators. The cowards and criminals who attempted to injure law enforcement and destroy property, I expect you will have your day in court and will be held accountable. We cannot and should not stand for the shameful actions of a few that attempt to distract from the important message everyone came together to share. Over the past several days, Lieutenant Governor and I have had conversations with members of the black and Latino communities, elected officials, members of the clergy, and public safety. That dialogue has been productive, and we're working on ways to enhance transparency and accountability across the Massachusetts law enforcement system. As I said earlier, there are no easy answers, but there's no shortage of important, bright ideas, and we intend to pursue those closely. I know this has been a difficult week for many. And in the past two months, this pandemic has brought with it the loss of life and the loss of connection with loved ones and pushed many of us far beyond what many of us ever thought we would have to handle. Now, we know Massachusetts is strong, and you all have shown it. Parents juggling work and educating their kids amid massive disruption. Frontline workers, nurses, doctors, medical professionals performing under pressure day after day. Community members doing the right thing to help one another. And without these acts of kindness, we'd never be able to get through this. I want to thank you. That's real leadership, offering kindness and supporting one another when it's needed most. That's the kind of leadership this country needs. The country needs empathy, not hostility. The company needs to heal, not fracture. And here in the Commonwealth, we plan to continue to talk, listen, and push progress forward. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about the latest public health data and the reopening policies we're working on to support our Commonwealth for phase two. We have some new health and safety protocols for the sectors of the economy that will reopen next. Massachusetts has now conducted over 600,000 COVID-19 tests. Around 5% of the tests reported yesterday came back positive. In mid-April, 27% of the cases were coming back positive every day. And this is a drop of 77% in positive tests since the beginning of May. This is obviously a very significant drop and an important piece of data that we're paying close attention to. And as of yesterday, 1,657 patients were hospitalized due to COVID-19. As another way of thinking about that fact, 
the three-day average of the number of patients that are hospitalized for COVID-19 has dropped by 50% over the past 30 days. These positive trends in the public health data are the primary indicators of how COVID-19 is impacting our communities, and it will continue to determine how and when we pursue measures associated with our reopening program. We've also made significant progress in fighting COVID, and more people are opening businesses. But as more things reopen, and as we get into the summer, we must all remember how quickly we move forward will ultimately depend on how well we all do our jobs. Cover your face, wash your hands and surfaces, distance yourself from others, and be vigilant with respect to symptoms. And please stay home when you can, and especially if you don't feel well. As we move ahead to start our reopening program, we must continue to ramp up the viral testing we've been doing for COVID-19. On Saturday, the command center filed a plan with the federal government to expand COVID-19 testing and has received $374 million in federal funding to do so. Our goal is to expand testing for symptomatic individuals and their close contacts and to upgrade our state's epidemiological technology infrastructure. Massachusetts, as we all know, is one of the states that's been hardest hit by COVID-19 and has had the third highest number of positive COVID-19 cases per capita in the country. It's important that we stay on top of testing to expand access and to monitor for outbreaks. Now, since we began testing, we've been able to test about 4.4% of our population each month. We'd like to see that ex percentage expand as we build additional capacity. And by the end of June, we're looking to expand lab capacity to be able to test 45,000 tests per day. DPH is also taking steps to expand their lab testing capacity at the state lab. Currently, the state lab can process about 1,000 tests per day. The department will install two platforms, one to increase diagnostic tests by 1,300 molecular tests per day, and one to conduct up to 1,600 serology tests per day. To better identify communities that have limited access to testing, the Department of Public Health will create a strategic testing program expansion, or so-called STEP program, to identify important sites that need to have additional attention. The goal is to open 20 of these sites by the end of July for areas with a high number of COVID-19 cases where there isn't sufficient testing capacity or so-called testing deserts. All of this expanded testing capability is essential to our contact tracing program because this is how we bring the fight to the virus and expand the hard-fought gains we've already made. We appreciate the federal government's support and the $374 million that they've allocated to Massachusetts to get this underway. But to build a comprehensive testing and tracing program that sustains our Commonwealth for the next several months, we'll need additional resources. And our administration urges Washington to continue to work with states and make more funding available for testing and tracing so that we can fight this virus with every tool and resource and prevent it from spreading into our communities in the months ahead. On the reopening, I signed an executive order on Monday that allows businesses to prepare to reopen in phase two. As a reminder, our public health experts will be monitoring health data all week to determine when we can start phase two, and we plan to be here with you on Saturday to detail the results and when phase two would start. We know that businesses are eager to prepare for reopening and families are looking for guidance on services like childcare and summer camps. I think the information we have today will help many parents begin to plan for the summer and will help businesses take the right steps to fight COVID in their facilities as they reopen. I'd now like to turn the podium over to the Lieutenant Governor to talk a bit more about this in more detail. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. First, I just want to say that I join the Governor in expressing my support and my gratitude to our many friends and neighbors that have shared their voices and demonstrated their views peacefully and safely over the last few days during this important and impactful time here in our Commonwealth and across our nation. The murder of George Floyd was a tragedy. It was wrong and it was an act of racism. We cannot and will not tolerate these injustices. We must listen, 
learn, and make progress in this fight. I also would like to say thank you to the brave men and women in law enforcement for keeping our residents and our cities and towns safe. The violent and criminal behavior that has taken place in certain areas around our state by a small group is unacceptable and is certainly distracted from the peaceful and powerful messages that so many have come forward uh, to share and to display. As a Commonwealth, we must all continue to come together in order to move forward, to make progress, and to end this racist and unacceptable behavior. Over these past few months, our state's economy and our cities and towns and our communities have faced unprecedented challenges. But we will continue pushing forward to a new normal as we work with our industry partners to reopen our economy in, in Massachusetts. I'd like to start uh, today regarding the reopening to thank, uh, as the governor discussed, uh, our, our, our many industries who have worked with us through this phased uh, reopening pro process. And in particular, uh, thank the retail industry that has uh, done an awful lot over these past uh, few months uh, to support the residents of our Commonwealth and also uh, deal with specific challenges, especially our smaller retailers. And in just a few minutes, you'll hear from Secretary Keneally, who will talk more about that. And I want to thank the many people in retail and in our uh, business communities that have helped us uh, to make the decisions relative to the phased reopening of our economy. Our hospitality and tourism work group continues to meet to address the challenges and the protocols for that industry. And we are mindful of the sacrifices that local retailers have made and are incredibly grateful to small business owners who did their part to slow the spread of COVID-19. As we move forward in reopening our economy, we will continue to balance the public health and our economic health and do everything we can to support our businesses. We know that many special small businesses in our downtowns and our main streets make up not only the foundation of our con economy, but truly the character uh, that we enjoy so much in our communities. And we work, we'll work together with each and every one of our partners at the local level in th our 351 cities and towns to do what's best for our business communities across our state. And I am confident that we will come out of this stronger and we will do this together. Balancing life uh, in a pandemic has been challenging for all of us. And as the mother of two, two teenagers, I uh, do a lot of that uh, with our family, as I know the families across our Commonwealth do too. And for both of my kids, uh, their sports teams have been incredibly important to them and have been a big part of how they have grown uh, as young individuals. And speaking from our personal experience, I know how different uh, time has been for many families that have children in sports, uh, used to spending time together on the sidelines and the bleachers and cheering our kids on uh, is one of the greatest joys. It's been even tougher for our kids that miss their friends and their teammates and the togetherness they feel as they practice and enjoy their time competing in, in games and events that they a big part of their lives. As the part of Monday's order, as the governor talked about, we included a framework uh, in addition uh, for, for businesses to get ready uh, for opening in phase two, but also for amateur uh, organized sports activities and programs uh, during phase two. Today, we are releasing guidance and workplace safety standards for these outdoor adult sports, youth sports, and summer sports camps. This guidance includes guidelines for facility operators as well as activity organizers. As part of phase two, outdoor athletic facilities can be open for organized youth and adult sports activities in accordance with the guidance. Games, scrimmages, and tournaments are currently not permitted for any organized sports activities and contact sports must limit activities to no contact drills and practices. 
For indoor sports and athletic facilities, designated organizations can reopen only to supervised youth, sports leagues, and summer sports camps for participants under the age of 18. In addition to the general mandatory safety standards, all businesses are required to adopt and maintain. Facility operators and activity organizers will also adhere to specific uh, protocols for social distancing, hygiene, staffing, and operations, and cleaning and disinfecting, just like other industries that have opened in phase one and are preparing to do so in phase two. So for more information, there's an awful lot on mass.gov slash reopening. The guidances, uh, we just encourage you to take a look at those and get ready uh, for a reopening uh, in, a, in a safe way to welcome back uh, your customers and your work workers. Uh, and now I'd like to turn it over to Secretary Keneally, who's going to discuss the guidance for retailers in more detail. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. As we work to reopen the Massachusetts economy safely, we continue to partner with the business community to limit the spread of COVID-19 by adopting safety standards designed to protect workers and customers alike. Now, throughout the pandemic, retailers had to adapt their businesses by shifting to online retail, by taking orders by phone, and by shipping products by mail. Last week, as part of phase one of reopening, retail businesses started offering curbside pickup to their customers. On Monday, Governor Baker released guidance allowing retailers to bring workers back into their buildings to conduct preparations prior to reopening in phase two. And we think it is important to note to retail customers, when phase two begins, the retail customer experience will be different than what it was before COVID-19. Please remember to be kind and patient with retailers, their workers, and with your fellow patrons. The protocols and adjustments to business models that this crisis demands are new, and they will take some time for all of us to get used to. All guidance is now available at mass.gov reopening to review in detail, and we encourage owners and operators of retail businesses to stay up to date by visiting the website. These standards apply to all retail businesses and replace existing guidance for grocery stores and pharmacies. The only exception here is farmers markets, which will continue to be governed by DPH guidance. And if you're a retailer who's been operating as an essential service, you'll be required to comply with these retail safety protocols within one week of the start of phase two. Now, social distancing must remain top of mind for all of us to limit the spread of the virus. Uh, and in that regard, we want to highlight four areas of the new protocols in particular. First, each retail store must monitor customer entries and exits and limit occupancy at all times according to the guidance. Second, the same goes for shopping malls in similar spaces. And amenities like seating and food courts and children's play areas must remain closed. Third, we want to continue to give older adults exclusive time to access food and medications. And so grocery stores and retail stores with pharmacy services must provide at least one hour of dedicated time for adults 60 years of age and older. And we're encouraging all stores to offer exclusive hours and other accommodations for high-risk populations. And fourth, faith's coverings should be required for all workers and customers, excluding those unable to due, to due to a medical condition or disability. Workers and customers all have a role to play, whether cleaning high-touch areas, staying home when you're sick, or always wearing a face covering. And these mandatory protocols and best practices have been thoughtfully developed to ensure safety while bringing patrons back in the door to shop. Once again, retail owners and operators should visit mass.gov reopening to review the full standards in detail. We're in this together. We all want to reopen our state's economy successfully without public health setbacks. And we're making progress towards the second phase of reopening because residents continue to follow public health guidance and because businesses open now have done a great job implementing new workplace safety standards. Our retailers have been active participants in this process and we look forward to their continued partnership in preventing the spread of COVID-19 and helping Massachusetts move towards our new normal. Thank you.
Come on up, Commissioner. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, Secretary Keneally. The Department of Early Education and Care, in collaboration with our providers and communities, is actively working to build a better, more equitable, equitable future for, we envision for all of our children. With the recent events across the country and in our state, the dedication of our team, the educators and professionals we serve, feels more critical now than ever. And I am happy today to highlight some of the important work that has been happening this week to reopen childcare programs and continue supporting families. Childcare, recreational summer programs, and day camps serving youth are all critical components in getting families and the economy back to work. On Monday, in collaboration with the Department of Public Health, we released the minimum health and safety requirements that will guide the reopening of childcare and summer camp programs in phase two. As we talked to our childcare providers and stakeholders in planning, we understood that it will take time for childcare providers to adjust their spaces and their programming to meet the new requirements put on us by the virus. As the command center and leadership review the data to determine the timeline for phase two, we wanted to make sure that our providers could begin working now to reset their operations in preparation for serving families when it becomes safe to do so. These requirements outline the operational shifts that childcare field must make, like all industries, to keep the Commonwealth safe and find our new normal. Childcare will look different. And as a former preschool teacher, I want to acknowledge how hard this will be for both our educators and our families. Some examples of the changes you can expect include providers will need to scan uh, and screen all staff and children, including health checks, prior to allowing them into the space each day. There must be one point of entry for all families, and parents will need to drop children off on a staggered schedule at the door, so we can limit non-essential adults in our child care facilities. Daily activities will need to be redesigned to avoid close contact between children, encouraging social distancing whenever possible. To open in phase two, licensed providers will simply need to submit a plan and self-attestation to the Department of Early Education and Care to ensure that they are prepared to meet these requirements and to ensure they have protocols that can help keep families and staff safe. We encourage programs to be working now to think through these preparations and to be talking with families about what these new requirements will mean for them. We want providers to have conversations with parents collaborate on how to put in place protective measures that meets children's developmental needs as well as their safety. More tools, templates, and instructions will be released in the coming days. All providers may decide when they want to reopen, when they are ready to implement all of the health and safety requirements we've laid out. And we will continue to run our emergency child care program through the transition simply to ensure that essential families are not left without care as we reopen at scale. We intend for these requirements to be in place through the summer, but we will, we will amend them as the Commonwealth's COVID-19 status evolves and the public health experts learn more about the virus. We understand that social distancing is not easy with infants and toddlers. There will be many challenges in operationalizing these requirements. And I know that there is a lot of anxiety in the field, and I assure you that our approach is meant to be supportive, not punitive. We are relying on the expertise of the professionals in the field to redesign their approaches to early education and care, adjust their daily activities, lay out their spaces to encourage children to remain six feet apart while still enjoying their days. We recognize that like many industries, COVID-19 has presented significant unexpected challenges for childcare. We have worked hard to minimize the burden that this will be for childcare providers while also abiding by the best public health standards and advice. The research on the impact of this crisis on children is still evolving and we are not through it yet. As we move through recovery, the department is going to continue to do everything to protect children and work uh, to make sure that the, less, that we are, the child care centers are less vulnerable to the exposure as we find uh, our new normal.
this crisis has caused the same challenges in our work as a department, but the pandemic has also given us an opportunity to, to engage in a different level and communicate differently with the field. Through biweekly town halls we've held with thousands of stakeholders, we continue to build the answers to questions that none of us knew we confronted a few months ago. This experience of thinking and engaging differently will serve the department and the field well, as the Commonwealth, like every state in the nation, tries to rebuild a different childcare system in a whole new context. And while this certainly is not the adventure that I thought I'd be tackling in my first year in this role, I am confident with the dedication of the early education and care community that I've seen through this crisis and their continued commitment to serve children and families safely across every community in the Commonwealth, despite all the challenges we've already encountered. We will ensure that Massachusetts continues to serve as a model for our national colleagues. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary Keneally, and Commissioner Sam. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to, as we continue to open our society and economy, we continue to strengthen our data as well as provide safety and health guidelines for organization and services. I'm going to provide information on some additional data upgrades, nursing facilities, and a mention of camps. Before I do, I want to just pick up from uh, what Commissioner Sam did. About 10 days or so ago, since it's one long day, I don't actually remember what day it was, but about 10 days ago, the governor asked the command center to bring together early education and care, the Department of Public Health and Environmental Affairs, so that we could put together and put forth the minimum health and safety standards for youth serving programs in the Commonwealth. With the goal of not what are all the barriers, but what are the opportunities of the strength of early child care public health and our environmental friends in order to put forth minimum health and safety standards so that we could start to reopen youth and child serving programs. And that is what Commissioner Sam has put forth and we've put forth in the public so that our camps, our child care programs and other municipal programs can be prepared so that children and youth can enjoy the summer. So just briefly about camps. Camps will be allowed, so day camps will be allowed to open in phase two. They will obviously need to increase their health services staff to having at least two health staff on site. And other protocols require that campers and counselors stay together in their groups. I don't like to think about cohorts when I think of kids. I like to think about them staying in their groups. And staff will have to move between groups. And staff will not be able to move between groups either during the day or from day to day unless needed to provide specific supervision of specialized activities such as swimming. And camps may not take campers on field trips or for other off-site travel at this time. And residential camps and overnight stays will be allowed in phase three, assuming what happens with our, with our public health data. Data. Earlier this week, Consistent with new CDC guidance, we now include data on probable cases and deaths in addition to confirmed cases and death. Every Wednesday, which is today, every Wednesday, as you know, we also provide some weekly information. Beginning this afternoon, we're adding two new data fields plus updating one existing field. The new fields include the number of individuals who have recovered from COVID-19. The second is the number of COVID cases reported for inpatient psychiatric units and freestanding psychiatric hospitals. And the third data is updated information on our nursing facility accountability and support audit surveys, specifically the results of the second round of nursing facility audits. As you know, we, get, we began auditing nursing homes on May 4th and last Friday, May 29th, we completed the second round of four rounds of audits. The nursing home clinical audits are based on a 28-point infection control checklist. The results of these audits directly impact additional funding a facility will receive going forward if they are in the red or yellow infection control category. We required, as you know, all nursing homes also test the, had to test the residents and staff by May 25th as a condition of receiving additional funding. 
I'm pleased to report that 353 of the 360, or 97 percent, met this requirement. As you may also recall, in the first round of audits, the period from May 4th to May 15th, all 360 nursing homes were audited. Facilities were categorized by red, yellow, or green based on their failure to meet one or more core competencies. If you failed, we had five categories that if you failed one, you failed the entire test. So those have sort of like waited. Facilities in the red were based on that, their failure. So many of the facilities in the red category would have received a high enough score to be in green if they had not missed that one core measure of competency. In round one, 228 of 360 were green, 132 were red. Between the first and second audits, all facilities in the red received targeted infection control training, and they were also prioritized for additional support, including our rapid response team or crisis management supports. In the second round of audits, which will be posted today, that occurred from May 18th to May 29th, 230 nursing homes were audited and included all of the 132 facilities that were red in the first round. Facilities, it also included facilities with historic infection control tags and or have been identified as chronic low quality, low occupancy, plus a few randomly selected facilities. In the second round of audits, 180 are in the green, one facility is categorized as yellow, and 49 facilities remain in the red. All facilities in the red and yellow will be audited again within the next two weeks and will continue to receive enhanced supports from us. Overall, the results of the second round of audits demonstrate encouraging improvement among many nursing facilities. The number of facilities in the red decreased by 37% in round one and 14% in round two. The most common missed core competency remains the improper use of PPE. Facilities that consistently have low scores on audits and that we believe may, may potentially endanger the health, safety, or welfare of residents will not be eligible for continued enhanced funding and subject to additional consequences, including potential termination from Medicaid receivership, and other sanctions. Visitation. As you've heard, beginning today, family visitation restrictions at nursing homes, rest homes, and assisted living facilities have been eased to allow for scheduled outdoor visits. And while we continue to promote alternative electronic methods for communication with families between residents and visitors, such as Skype, FaceTime, there's nothing we know like an in-person visit. The guidance has been issued for nursing home, rest homes, and assisted living facilities detailing how to safely allow scheduled visits with residents to occur. The measures include a resident who is suspected or confirmed to be infected with COVID cannot be visited at this time. A resident who has recovered may be visited. Visitors must be screened for fever or respiratory symptoms. Any individuals with symptoms of COVID-19 infection may not be permitted to visit with a resident. A long-term care facility staff member who's trained in patient safety and infection control must always remain with a resident during the visit. Visits must be limited to no more than two individuals at this time. And of course, we need to engage in social distance, which I know will be hard, but a visitor must always remain six feet from the resident and attending staff members during that visit. And staff and residents will wear surgical face masks and visitors must wear a face covering or mask for the duration of the visit. These guidances are for all nursing home, rest homes, and assisted living facilities, with the exception of the Holyoke and Chelsea Soldiers Home. Additional guidance will be issued in the coming days for the homes and other 24-7 congregate care facilities. With that, Governor Baker. They open up in phase two, don't they? Yes. Yeah, they open in phase two. The guidance is issued today. Yeah, it'll be. It's going to be issued today. Governor, um, I I wonder about 
some of the massive protests that have been happening over the last four days, are you concerned about a spread and a spike in cases just as the state is really getting into reopening? So anytime there's um, big gatherings uh, with close quarters, um, the potential for spread is real. And um, part of what's been successful here in the Commonwealth for the past uh, two and a half months has been the commitment people have made, mostly voluntarily, um, to abide by the guidance from DPH and others that wearing a face covering, only going out if you have to, um, maintaining distance, washing your hands, sanitizing, all that stuff uh, has had a tremendously positive impact on the growth of the uh, coronavirus here in Massachusetts. Um, obviously, uh, we're going to continue to test. We're ramping up our testing program, as we said. Uh, and our tracing program, but it'll be a few weeks before we really know what the impact of that is. I will say this: many of the folks who've been in those um, who've been in those demonstrations and marches have been wearing face coverings. But, but does it um, present challenges for the contact tracers too? I mean, if you're in a group of a thousand people, who knows? Who? Yeah, it absolutely will create issues um, on a number of fronts. But uh, as I said the other day. Uh, close contact is close contact, which means being sort of very close to somebody for at least 15 minutes. Um, many cases, a lot more than that. And that's typically where contact tracers start, but sure. I mean, as I said, big gatherings like that, they come with significant risks. What would, do, you have, do you have tools <clears throat> to try to stop protests? I mean, obviously, I mean, we, we didn't go to church for a couple months. Um, are there any tools to just try to put a pause on it so that we, in the name of public health? Um, you know, there have been protests, none this big, but there have been protests on one thing or another uh, during the course of the pandemic and during the course of the orders we've had in place. Um, and no one's been arrested, no one's been ticketed, nobody's been fined. I think our view on this is that um, First Amendment rights like that are um, a balancing act for us in dealing with, uh, in dealing with this pandemic and the contagious nature of it. Um, we certainly appreciate the fact that many of the folks who've been involved in these protests um, have worn uh, have worn face coverings, and I've seen a ton of hand sanitizer. Believe it or not, um, with many of them as well. But as I said in my remarks, this is a balancing act between giving people the right to speak up about what they believe, and at the same time recognizing and understanding that. Um, we are still in the midst of a terribly dangerous and wildly contagious virus, and, um, and, and this is certainly going to be a risk. Do you have a tool, though? There is no tool to do it? I mean, I the, only, the only thing I can say is that people should pursue the same types of approaches that we've talked about for everything else, which is face coverings, distance to the extent they can do that, um, and, uh, and, and hygiene. Um, but. Uh, as I said, there have been protests over the course of the past several months, none that have gotten the attention or been as large as any of these. But no, one's, no one at the state or the local level has tried to shut anybody down from executing that First Amendment right. What would an impact look like? Uh, positive tests in Suffolk County, hospitalizations in Boston area hospitals. Uh, are there key factors you're looking at to determine if these protests are causing an uptick in well, it would be this, I mean, part of the reason why we have those elements on our dashboard is because we, we are, those are the ones we believe are the most important indicators around both spread generally and around the healthcare's ability to serve everybody who gets sick. I mean, remember, while we have been very pleased by the progress that we've made on positive test rates, getting to the point where um, I think our seven-day average at this point is way below 10 percent, right? Um, down from almost 30 percent not so long ago. Um, the other really important measures we pay attention to are COVID hospitalizations, ICU beds, and hospitals operating in surge. Okay? And that's because, in the end, the contagious nature of the virus and the, uh, the ability of the healthcare system to deal with sort of an avalanche of cases from the very beginning has been, uh, in many ways, one of the biggest and most important health concerns we've had. Should you, put even more testing should, you, should you put even more testing resources into communities of color because of these gatherings? I think the 20, uh, the 20 
sites that are being pursued as part of that initiative that I talked about in remarks are for the most part of communities of color, yeah. Is that the Governor, same plan from before the protest? Pardon me? Is that the same plan since before the gathering, before the protest last week? Uh, we were work you mean did we change our plan as yeah, a result of the protest? Of since this yeah, yeah. But that's why we that is also why we partnered with the community health centers and set up the programming with them. Same reason. About this idea of restricting access to grocery stores and pharmacies for people sixty plus per an hour each day, sounds like a good idea to protect a population at risk. Is that something you would think could be expanded to restaurants, to other type of retail stores? That's a good question. I'm going to let people who probably spent some time thinking about it speak to them. Secretary Keneally and I and our reopening board spent a lot of time uh, with restaurant uh, owners. And we outlined the industry protocol uh, with their input. And the industry protocol is focused on uh, three basic things. Distance, uh, the use of face coverings coming and going, and sanitization. And the uh, ability to take a tabletop and locate it six feet from another table uh, will require uh, restaurants to rethink how they uh, organize the seating in, indoors and outdoors. Uh, I would not want to uh, be overly prescriptive uh, to restaurants about how to uh, gain uh, the attention of their customers and patrons to want to come back but that might be something that they would consider uh, a, a, an opportunity uh, to have uh, an older population return uh, to a restaurant so that they feel comfortable. Uh, but I would want to leave that up to restaurant owners uh, to design a program uh, to get their workforce back, but also to help their patrons feel comfortable and confident that going back to restaurants, both outdoors and indoors, makes sense for them. And other types of retail, like clothing stores, Macy's, Target, I mean, could that be something where you take an hour and allow people to have an access? I mean, the uh, business owners uh, can certainly go beyond uh, and design uh, what they need to to get their customers back uh, into their places of uh, their establishments. So I, I don't think we need to mandate that, but I do think it would be an opportunity for businesses to consider. A child care, uh, you're concerned that a lot of uh, child care facilities just might not come back, that they look at these guidelines and say, we just can't do it, or that many of their the parents might not send their kids back and they'll have to go out of business because there's just not enough kids to, to stay uh, solid. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I'll let the commissioner speak to this because she knows a lot more about it than I do, but this is obviously something we've talked about quite a bit, and uh, and I would start with, the unprecedented, the unprecedented nature of what we're going through here. It's very hard in many cases, as we make decisions about a lot of things, to predict what's going to happen. Um, and I think one of the simplest examples of that was um, on Monday, uh, office space in Boston opened up to 25% after office space opened everywhere else around Boston the week before. And there was a lot of talk that that would probably create a lot of additional traffic. It didn't. And it may that at some point it will, but I think one of the things we just don't know is how, um, how people are going to respond to this thing, especially in the short term. Um, but I know you spent a lot of time talking to the field about this, so if you want to speak to that commission, you should what, go right what ahead. What do you think you've gone before the commissioner? How would you consider subsidies for providers to help get them through, uh, to keep them afloat until things get through? I think it would depend on the circumstances. I mean, the ones I'm, I mean, I am really interested in making sure that we had a program in place for kids and families at risk, okay? That represents about 20 to 25 percent of the child care system generally. Um, and then there's a whole other part of the system here that's outside the bounds of, um, of what I think of as, as the part that the state's the primary payer for. Some of them we have a role in and we participate with, but the one where we're really sort of like the vast majority of the funding and the, and the, and the relationship uh, are the ones that deal with kids who uh, are in at-risk families. And, and those in particular, I would really like to see find a way back because 
um, because those kids get a lot more out of childcare than um, than just being in a childcare center. Do you want to speak to this, Sam? Yes. Um, yeah, we understand that that like every industry, these small businesses are are really. Um, are struggling as families decide whether to come back into the system for health reasons. Um, so we have, as the, the governor mentioned, uh, focused our federal funding that, that we received towards um, those providers, about 50% of our providers that are serving that 20% of, um, of our vulnerable uh, families. Um, and then we're looking at it in two-month intervals and trying to make sure that uh, the requirements and the funding that we have put in um, last through the summer and, and uh, as we uh, reassess the, both the public health and the business business health landscape um, looking forward. Could I ask a question of Secretary Sutter, please? Sure. Uh, I wondered if you could be a little more specific. You said the uh, nursing homes that came out red in this. I'm going to grab my notes. Okay. <laughs> yep. The nursing homes that came out red in this second round of audits, uh, I think you said that they will lose some of the funding. Yes. Uh, how much funding did they actually lose? And could you talk a little bit about the philosophy? So they're struggling to meet these demands. Now we're going to reduce their funding. Does oh. that, is that, uh, so, that work? Yep. So, so as you recall, Bruce, there was two rounds of funding for nursing homes. So the first round of funding was $130 million and included a bought across the board increases for nursing homes. So that is not at risk. And then we put forth um, another $130 million um, package that is an accountability package. And it was very clear about what that meant. That meant, one, um, all staff and residents needed to be tested. And we defined that as 90% of residents and 90% of staff. And then had to agree to um, basically four rounds of audits, and that we would make that data public, the audits, because we thought that was very important, using the green, yellow, red. I usually do red, yellow, green, green, yellow, red. Um, and in the areas that was clear, or became clear, that it was around PPE, infection control, staffing, and um, we also added the fourth of communication. And that those um, and that the $130 million, so in the first round, so for the first two weeks, the $130 million, the, a portion of the $130 million went to all of the nursing homes, so they get that. And then it's subsequent audits, so there's three sets of audits after that. So if in the second round of audit, you're red, then you will see a 10, it's about a 10% decline in that second enhanced package. Right. And that, right. Keeps and that will keep ratcheting down. And yes, it is a consequence. And hopefully it's a motivator to improve. Because the other things that we have in place, as you know, is that we have, uh, we have rapid response teams. So if, you have, if there's staffing issues, we have rapid response teams to help come in to help stabilize staffing. And then I have a crisis management uh, group who's also available to help administrators think through their PPE issues, their infection control protocol, um, protocols and the like. And we have in place using Mass Senior Care Association of uh, um, a infection control, like it's not a, like here's your plan, but here's how you implement your plan. So it's really, it is, a, it is um, incentives and consequences, right. but felt it was important. You know, the first round was 130 million across the board. Um, plus um, extra funding if you created COVID dedicated units. And then when it was clear that that was not sufficient, um, it, I felt it was important that the second package of funding had to come with very clear, very specific accountability measures. Have you found any facility that you would relate to like fully open source? Have you found any facilities that you're very alarmed about? So there is a, so the data is up, as you know, and we actually put up now the the uh, by, by facility, the death, the actual death numbers. Um, there are, and as I said at the end of my remarks, there, is a, there are a group of 
So second round, right now we have a smaller number of nursing homes that continue to be red. Um, I'm expecting that those who have, if the issue is truly um, the proper use of PPE, and you know that may sound easy, but there is actually a very clear protocols about how you put on gowns, how you put on face coverings, masks, and the like, how you take them off. And it's often not how staff put them on, it's how you then take off um, personal protective equipment. Um, and that is, seems to be an area that is of a particular challenge. I actually think with more um, you know, um, coaching and things, a number of facilities will improve on that. And then there may be a small number of nursing homes for which we need to have um, um, a different strategy about whether they continue to be nursing homes in Massachusetts uh, and the like. Governor, can I ask you about police accountability? We have another protest coming up this yeah. afternoon. And a, a city councilor from Boston spoke of the motion yesterday about having a state trooper pull a gun on him when he got lost, and he said he was simply turned around. Um, he wasn't hit, and he wasn't charged, but he was wounded by it. Do you feel there's enough training among the state police to prevent racial profiling and prevent these types of incidents from happening based on somebody's look? There's been a um, significant amount of um, redesign with respect to state police training. And in fact, one of the reasons Colonel Mason is now the colonel uh, was because he spent a tremendous amount of time in his interview with both the lieutenant governor and me discussing the fact that uh, there was not enough training of that kind baked into the academy or to the continuing education programming of the state police. Um, there's also been a fairly significant expanse of de-escalation, cultural competency, sensitivity training, community-based um, outreach training uh, that goes through all of the municipal training programs uh, in Massachusetts, and there's more that should be done there. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we've been talking to legislators about. How we bake that into how we bake that into a proposal. So um, we spend a lot of time talking to our colleagues in local government, and, um, and we work very hard to provide them with the support they need to keep people safe uh, during these events. And uh, I think anybody who's watched these events or witnessed them uh, appreciates the fact that the vast majority, and I mean like the vast majority of the people who are part of these protests, are there to make a point and to make it peacefully. That is so obvious, I'm amazed that anybody could say anything other than that, at least here in Massachusetts. Um, and I think that's the most important element of what any of us has seen so far. Um, and, I, and I believe that that message uh, is an important one, as I said during my remarks uh, yesterday. Uh, and it's one where I believe we need to make progress, which is why we're talking to the folks that we're talking to about what we could do administratively or with legislation. Uh, but that said, uh, there are some very bad actors who are running under the cover of those protests um, and inflicting property damage and physical damage uh, on businesses, on um, public buildings, on automobiles, and on, uh, and on people including uh, members of law enforcement. And I think it's critically important for law enforcement to keep people safe, and we will do all we can to make sure that our colleagues in local government have the support they need to make sure these protests, these demonstrations are peaceful and safe, not just for the law enforcement who are there, but for the people who go there peacefully to engage in a peaceful demonstration. What will the state do to help the law enforcement? It's, we were hearing reports that some of these rioters are looking up their addresses and even threatening to go to their homes, but what will the state do moving forward? It seemed like last night went a lot better than Sunday night. Well, I think part of it is just about making sure that we're doing a good job of coordinating and talking to our colleagues in local government and understanding how we can best help them. And um, Lieutenant Governor and I have been on calls almost every day since last Friday. Um, talking with our colleagues in, in local government about 
uh, what they're anticipating, what they anticipate, you know, what the route looks like, how big the crowd's going to be, where it's going to go. You know, just the kind of stuff that you would normally expect us to be talking to them about. Does the state need state-level standards for uh, peace officers the way that uh, the demonstration yesterday on the steps are calling for uh, standards for every municipality and the state police and decertification for officers that don't meet those standards anymore? I think one of the things um, we're going to talk to folks in the legislature and to folks in law enforcement about, are, that's exactly the sort of thing we're talking to them about. You don't have a problem, you don't have a problem with police wearing riot gear or something that um, Superintendent Boston Police has, has talked about, and yet a couple of politicians have said that it really incites problems with, with the protesters. I guess what I would say is that I think um, I think attitude has a lot more to do with this. And I said this the other day when somebody asked me about geography. And I said, I don't really, with respect to some of the bad actors uh, who are out there, and I said, I didn't really see it so much as a geography issue. I saw it as an attitude issue. And I would say the same about, um, about what's going on on the law enforcement side. This is much more about attitude. And I think, um, I think the folks in law enforcement have shown a remarkable amount of discipline and restraint. Uh, in their work and their effort to keep people safe. And, uh, and we all expect that that will continue to be the case. Um, some of the ones last night who uh, got hit by some of the stuff that got thrown um, probably wish they did have a little heavier kind of equipment on. But in the end, I'm going to let the locals make the call with respect to what they think the best way to protect their communities is and what the best way to protect their citizens and their residents is and what the best way uh, to protect their officers is. But at the end, it's about attitude. Could the LG maybe, I don't know, could the acceleration of the phase, could that happen later on um, with the fact that things seem to be going smoothly and people are understanding it, and as we get phase one and two, we kind of know how to do it. Do you see three and four happening less than three weeks? We'll tell you when we see the data. <laughs> Governor, now that uh, family members can go see residents in long-term care facilities, you get a, a meeting scheduled with your dad yet? I am going to go see my dad. Yeah. Soon? Yes. Soon. <laughs> yeah. Tell him we said hi. I will. Thank, Thank you. you.